the Commander Central episode 136, where we're going to be talking about GP Vegas. I'm Dana. I'm Max. And I'm Joey. You are not Chris. Where is Chris? Chris is at home, Dana. We're still in Vegas. Okay, so we're doing a special crossover episode with the EDH RecCast. Yeah. Welcome hi. aboard, Joey Schultz. Hi. I'm Joey Schultz from the EDH Redcast, Dana's real podcast. <laughs> yes, his real other show. <laughs> it's not the other show. You're the other show. You're guys. the other show. You're the other show. You're the other I show. I love you both equally. Settle down. It's a custody battle here, right, folks. Right, exactly. Mom and dad are fighting, and I don't <laughs> like it. So we have just finished too much magic to even contemplate. Um, I'm closing in on 100 games or so in the last week. Woof. It's insane. I haven't even played yet today, so that's insane. And that was your goal, too. Yes. Um, so this is all just madness. We've met so many people. We've eaten so much food. We've been up way too late and slept way too little. All of these things are definitely true. Um, yes. So it's been a really, really good time. As a result of that, though, we are kind of struggling to maybe record a show <laughs> that is anything but talking about Vegas, so we're just going to talk about Vegas. Um, Let's do it. First things first, gentlemen, we did a rotisserie draft that we had talked about a little bit. Joey didn't do that, That's but true. you did watch a little bit of it. Yes, it looked like a bunch of fun watching you guys try to play with those shambled, almost put together decks. <laughs> yeah, like, like they were almost <laughs> almost cohesive. Um, so let's talk about that briefly. Max and I were in different pods to start with. Yep, we split all the content creators up to make it fair, apparently. Yes, <laughs> yes. <laughs> um, so... How did yours go? How did your deck play? How did the decks you played against go, Max? Well, I piloted Anafenza. I sat down against a Horde of Notions deck by Brando from CCO Podcast. Okay, so five colors. Yep. Uh, Ryan Green from Commander Social was playing Golos Tireless Tracker. Okay. So there's another five color deck. And Dan Krause was playing um, someone in green black that let him do. Oh, Hapatra. Yeah, Hapatra. Okay, okay. So how did the decks all play, first of all? Um, I got land hose, but it played well once I had four lands, I could do things. So it was a limited pool, like, basically if there was a card that was taken, no one else could take it. So right. obviously there's some limitations to the power level, but it wasn't pre-con level or anything either. The decks legitimately could play and do things and have a theme and have a plan. For sure. Um, so you got land holes and didn't really kick yours off. Nope. The rest of the decks, what did they actually kind of do their thing and, and play out like intended? Um... Yes, for the most part. Dan Krause's deck definitely did, because he ended up going on to the final table. I think Ryan won via extra turns, though, okay. in our first pod. So, oh yeah, you cast a time stretch, and that was what it wound up taking it. Yep. So Dan's two-color deck, I wonder if that was an advantage for him not having... Because your land base is kind of limited, too. Oh, for no sure. Fe no fetches at all. No fetches. No fetches, while also just having limited access to the traditional ramp spells that Absolutely. people would look for. Right. Especially if you've got multiple five-color people at your table. That yes. sounds like it was very, very <laughs> difficult. And I didn't see much ramp. There was a lot of good removal, but there wasn't much ramp. Just yeah. because that was so spread out. For sure. My deck was all creatures or removal. I took this as a normal limited environment. And probably shouldn't have. <laughs> um, so the one I was in, I was playing Marchesa. It was an artifact deck. Um, there was a Hogak kind of grave synergy deck thing going on. There was a Naya... Um, creature deck with Mile as the commander, and I've now forgotten what the other one was that was being played. Moldrotha? The was Moldrotha deck. Uh, no, uh, uh, sorry, Yarok. Yarok. Um, Gross. Doing, yeah. doing ETB stuff. Um, yeah, that's the one that I stopped by, I looked at the table, yes. and I was like, oh, that person has a lot of things in play, and no one else seems to have things in yes. play. <laughs> uh, strategically speaking, I think what I did wrong was... Your card pool is limited, but you still have enough things in hand that you think you can play like you normally would in EDH. So you can deal with threats and handle all those things. And you really can't. I had a couple good cards in hand, but like I ran out of gas faster than I normally would. So even though I had that Assassin's Trophy or whatever, I didn't, it wasn't Assassin's Trophy, Reality Shift, say, and a counter spell, I didn't have the ability to replenish those kind of resources as rapidly as you usually do in Commander because... The draw pool was so much thinner. The ramp pool was so much thinner. So I think I overextended in that way. I dealt with threats that I maybe should have let slide in a regular game. In a regular game, I wouldn't let slide, and I should have let them slide in this game. Gotcha. Yeah. Um, the play of the game, though, that I have to, have to talk about was an early Graf Digger's Cage came down, which says you can't cast spells from your graveyard. 
But it also says creatures can't enter the battlefield from the graveyard. Trash card. And that's a, yeah, yeah, yeah. There you go. I'm an necromancer. I don't. I don't like Graf Digger's Cage. <laughs> I, I, I advise everyone stop listening to Dana's advice. Don't play <laughs> Graveyard Hate, everyone. It lets me win more if you don't play Graveyard Hate. This is why we're the real show. We appreciate. Right. Right. <laughs> so what happened with this Graf Digger's Cage? So so Ryan from CCO Podcast, after having you know first a board wipe went off, and then he playing Hogak had self milled quite a few things. Mm-hmm. He had a dozen creatures in his graveyard. And it was all setting up for a Twilight's Call to bring everything back, which he cast. And at that point in time, I had literally had nothing in my graveyard. Mm-hmm. So he like is going to bring in his dozen creatures. The Naya player had like four or five in his graveyard. I was going to bring those back. And I happened... I didn't notice it at the time. It took me like four or five seconds before I grabbed the Graph Digger's case to double check. <laughs> and I'm like, and I just flipped the card over to it. And I'm like, pointed at it. And creatures can't enter the battlefield from graveyards. So basically, he... He took the best time walk possible. He, he, he <laughs> did, his turn consisted of discarding a card and tapping all his lands. Ouch. In passive. Uh, and that, it was and it was beautiful. That hurts in my soul. That actually that that hurts me on a deep fundamental level. And I don't think that's a reflection on any Canadian podcasters or the CCO Woo! podcast. I don't think it means they don't understand magic <laughs> or how graveyards or strategies work. I wouldn't view that as a slight on their experience and I wouldn't say <laughs> that they're an inferior show for making such glaring mistakes. If you want to infer that about them, oh my god. I'm not going to tell you not to do that. I'm just not saying that about Ryan and Brando. I- I'm never going to get let back right. into the house of CCO. <laughs> oh my goodness, this is incendiary. Yeah. <laughs> I can't believe you would say this. Like, I-, I don't want to lean too much into the Canadian stereotype of they're all extremely nice, but good lord, they were so stupidly nice. Like, it was almost <laughs> offensively nice. They were such nice dudes. Uh, uh, to continue this, this, this side tangent, what's really hilarious about those guys is they're amazingly nice and astonishingly vulgar simultaneously, <laughs> which isn't a combination that I'm really used to, is guys being so nice and just dropping F-bombs so frequently in casual conversation. It's Amazing, pretty hilarious. Amazingly nice and astonishingly vulgar is what I want on my epitaph. Yeah, there we go. <laughs> what a great headstone that would be. Um, so so I got knocked out pretty early in that game, I think, because I, I ran out of resources. I went too aggressively. Um, Ryan kind of conspired with uh, Ginger Joe. Yep. And But, I mean, it was political. It, it made sense. It was a logical partnership. Yeah. Because the Yarok deck was doing a lot of Yarok stuff too, so that had to get knocked out. Yeah. L- well, listening to the decks that you guys played against, it does seem as though several of them, like, and, and just also having viewed the stuff that you were picking on Twitter when you were doing the Root History Draft online, uh, like, it does seem like you went for either very specialized strategies, like with the Hapatra you'd mentioned, or yep. you, know, you went with the Marchesa modular sort of deck, but then there's also like on the flip side of the specialized strategies that you were leaning into to try and make sure that you'd have cards to assemble that deck that no one else would take. It also seems that there were some of those quote good stuff decks that could kind of be a catch-all for anything yes. that was left in their decks, like Yarok or like Golos, because those would just be a good home for anything that they were able to get that no one else had taken. Well, like the Yarok deck works around the problem of, li- of a limited resource pool, because even if Yarok isn't out, that turn of witness is a good card, or that right. Turbo Cover is a good card, and if Yarok is out, you're just doubling up that single resource. Right. So that kind of papers over some of the flaws in the format inherent in having a limited card pool as well. Yeah. It's just interesting to see those two strategies, that you, you get the quote good stuff where you get the very hyper-specialized yeah. stuff. And it's sort of like those two extremes yep. and almost nothing in between. So the, the final game wound up being taken by... I don't even... Ryan, Ryan Green Ryan, took Ryan, it all home. With, with the time stretch, right? Is that yes. what it was? He yeah, took he it. did it in both games. So he had a time stretch at the end to basically just value out that final win condition. Yep. So congratulations, Ryan, from the Commander Social Podcast. I'm coming for that trophy next year. Next year, yeah. the, next year the ghosts go into max. Yep. So um, it was a lot of fun. I like doing it. I don't even know if I would change very much about no. it next year. I think I think we're trying to do it again, and maybe we'll expand and see if we can get someone like Joey in. And maybe okay. we'll do it. We'll do a team thing too. Maybe you and I will just do a team draft right. instead to free up slots. So. Uh, I think we'll definitely do it again. It was a lot of fun. And if you want to check with the guys at Commander Social, they have a spreadsheet you can download that does almost all the work. Yes, it does everything you need. There's a few fields you can change to set up the Twitter portion of it as well. Yep. Um, If that's how you want to do it, but you can do it in person either way. It works really slick, so I I would check with those guys. They have the template. I will... I think they'll repost it again this week. We'll make sure they do, so... 
Thanks a lot for organizing it, yes. um, Brian and Zach, and it went to a really good cause to get some money to a children's hospital. We raised close to two thousand dollars. I think. Sick. Yeah. Yeah, it was really cool. And we had a lot of like Josh Lee Kwai came by when we were playing and was you know watched the game for five minutes and Jumbo came by for a bit and sat and watched the game. So a couple of Watsy people came by. Yeah, yeah. So that was really really cool. Yeah, it was it was really fun to to witness as well. Like yeah. both watching you guys on Twitter, watching the drama unfold, especially when people were taking cards from each other. That yes, was really yeah, cool. yeah, yeah. But it was also just a lot of fun to to watch, just come by and see the way that people are strategizing. I, I really enjoyed it. I would definitely like to be part of it next year. Cool. Assuming that you know the the CCO folks don't take Dana's earlier incendiary <laughs> comments and uh, well, I think they like they could, it from they could treat it like a learning experience, like like an option to like get better at Commander. I think it's it's, it's a win win for everyone. You raise money, they improve their gameplay. Oh man, it's a it's a it's a perfect situation. So the next thing we'll talk about a little bit is the actual Command Zone, not the podcast, but the uh, Command Zone location at the GP. So for the first time, I think really ever, I guess. Minneapolis had a couple tables set aside. But nothing this specific. Yeah, and I know Star City Games is a small area, but like there were a thousand people able to be packed into this command zone. Over the over a thousand. Yeah, absolutely so much fun to be able to sit there and not have to move as you sometimes yes. do with yeah. other GPs. This was a very nice committed space and there was plenty of room for everyone to come in and play a bunch of games. So guess what? That's exactly what we did. Well, like yeah, one of the things did. we talked about was last year all the EDH rec cast PR, EDH rec website writers, we had some suites so we could go back and play games at like, you know, nine or ten o'clock. That's sweet as in S U I yes, yes. not sweets as in like candy. We just didn't have we'll probably had those. Too, Although though. we did have plenty of that there as well. I'm sure, I'm sure you did. I just wanted to clarify. <laughs> All right. So we could go back and play games. However, this year we noticed we just played at the GP until they kicked all us day out. Long until the doors closed. <laughs> um, and, and you could get more games in during the day too because you weren't moving around and trying to find people, trying to find spaces. It was just so much easier that like it kind of eliminated the need to do that to a degree. Yeah, I really, really enjoyed it, and I'm glad to hear that that's going to be a mainstay yes. at GPs going forward. Yeah, starting in October. And it wasn't just the play space, there were multiple judges walking around too. Yeah, that was a really nice help. In case you needed uh, like assistance with anything, say you know, you're know you from the CCO podcast and you cast a spell, and yeah. there's a graphic as a cage in play, right. if you, you like, can don't wait for a judge to have them judge you. If you don't understand a, a really common frequently played card that was in standard recently and got a, gets a ton of play in modern, if you don't know how that <laughs> card works, you can just ask a judge. So yeah, no, that's great. Um, Everything about that was fantastic, and I hope it's going to be a thing moving forward, and that's yeah. amazing. I will pay for it for every GP Absolutely, we go to. Absolutely, for sure. Yeah, that was that was quite worth it, very much. Um, the other thing we will quick touch on was the pre-release. Oh. Uh, or the release. The release, the release. I, guess yeah. I guess it is the release, because it didn't come out ahead of time. Yeah, the pre-cons came out. Yeah, so we got those this week, and we got to play a couple games at, at, at the release party, I guess it was. Yeah. Um, what deck did you get, Joey? I ended up, well, so I was actually, they distributed the decks at random. It was I, random, yeah. I was given the uh, Gear Ed Populate deck in Naya colors, but there was someone next to me who came up to me and he was just like, hey, so I've actually already got like a, a deck sort of built for this back home and I was wondering if you'd be willing to trade them just like this matters way more to you than it does to me. I'm happy with any deck. Here you go. And then we traded, I got the uh, Savin the Chronoplasm deck, the Jeskai Flashback. Okay. And what did you play, Max? I ended up with the Jeskai Flashback deck as well. Oh, nice. Well, I played the Jira deck. I actually got the Morph deck. And ended up switching and, as well. And switched with somebody else who who, ha who wanted the Morph deck. And I, I just di I didn't... That's the only one I didn't pe want. Pe so pe People win -win. want that deck? Yeah. <laughs> Ooh, that's savage. <laughs> well, the one thing I didn't like with the deck was there's one way to build it, basically. I just don't care about morphs. It is a little bit on rails. Yeah. yeah. So if you want that, that's great, but I just didn't. Where right. the other ones were much more interesting, so I thought they were more open. Yeah, a little bit more directions that you can go with those. So I didn't pick the Jira deck specifically. That was just the one he had, so I got it, and that was fine. Um, so what were your thoughts on the decks actually playing them? Uh, well, so I have one... Very funny story, or I think it's funny. Oh yeah, no, that's uh, good. Yeah. I only actually got to play, on the night that uh, they came out during the Commander Party, um, I actually only got to play one game with that deck on that actual night. I've, pl I've played like four or five um, throughout the, the course of the rest of the weekend, but on the Commander Party itself, I only played one, and I actually played against Don Miner, guy who made EDH rec. Um, and it became very, very awkward at one point, because it, eventually the game whittled down to just me and him. Um, he was on the... Uh, 
the Rakdos Madness deck, and he had earlier in the game cast in Garrick's Wake to just totally demolish the rest of my board. But then I was able to set up by casting a Storm Herd, and I had like 37 Pegasi in play, and I was like definitely going to win on the next turn. He also had a pretty sizable board state, but there was nothing that he was going to be able to do to get past all of those flyers. So he uses his Magus of the Wheel to like draw seven more cards, see if he's got an answer, and he draws another in Garrick's Wake. Wait, did you say another? Yes, there was a collation error. We actually ended up counting the cards in his deck later, and there were exactly 100. And it's not like he mixed that card up with anyone else's right. deck. We're not really sure where it happened, so it was just a collation error. He has yet to check the exact deck list that he got against the deck list that it's supposed to be to see what card it was missing. Doesn't seem to have been any of the new cards, so that's good. <laughs> yeah. But yeah, he had two in Garrick's Wake, and he was just like, well, what do I do? If I cast this, I win. But if I don't cast this, you win. Right. <laughs> well, I'm going to cast this. <laughs> yeah, right, right. Not his fault. Yeah. Uh, so, I mean, that was definitely fun. But aside from that, I, I, Don, if you're listening, I don't count that as a victory. You'd already cast <laughs> one of those earlier in the game. So that doesn't, that doesn't really count. I, I, I'm with you there. I'll support that. Thank uh, you. Unless Don's listening, in which case. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but aside from that, I found that the deck uh, demolished everyone. I played... Uh, like uh, four other games aside from that, and I am four and zero oh on those games with Sabin. Um, nice. A lot of people actually asked, uh, you know, oh, do you think that you should play Elsha out of the box instead? And I was like, absolutely not. Um, so this is a very, very defensive deck. Sabin prevents all damage that would be dealt to him, and the value that you get from casting the spells in the graveyard is exceptional. Like the the win conditions in that deck include things like Gutter Snipe and the uh, Burning Vengeance. So casting things from the graveyard and copying them was so much value. Plus, the deck is like 40% lands. So if yeah. you are playing something like Elsha out of the box, you have a really big chance of whiffing off the top. Right. So that, that was just my take. But with Savin, I also I found it, it was very difficult for me to lose. Especially some of the other decks seemed to struggle to be able to do anything because of how effective I was at being defensive. Things like Pramacon and Savin itself were just so good at preventing anyone from being able to do anything to me. Um, I even played a game, actually. This was probably one of the more awkward moments. And this is just sort of getting into, I guess, like what I thought of the pre-con environment overall. But the morph deck really seemed to struggle to close things out. There was someone who played a biomass mutation, which like turns all of their yep. features into base power XX until end of turn. He played that early in the game, and then halfway through the game afterwards, he's like, is that my only win condition? Which it probably was in that deck. It's just yeah. like, I, I feel as though I'm struggling to find anything else that can get these morphs to finally like get there and close out the game. So that was kind of an interesting thing. And me being on the defensive controlling side, it just seemed like things were a bit weighted towards my favor. Sure. Yeah. Well, and, and like we mentioned a little bit before with the rotisserie draft, too, in an environment where resources are so limited, those decks that have the ability to gain those resources right. are that much more powerful. Yeah. But, Max, what was your experience? You also got the Jessica I did. Flashback deck. I played Elsha out of the box. Ooh. And I will completely agree with what you just said. I, there are enough times where I got her out on the board and I stalled out because I hit land after land You know, every time I drew. So you stall out, you can't use her ability. I agree. Out of the box, Sabine's the best general. I think if you're going to start tuning the decks, I do think that Elsha's probably going oh. to be more powerful than Sabine. Yeah. There's a limited number of cards you can cast from your graveyard in like the greater commander meta that Sabine's going to be able to do like really, really effectively. But I do think Elsha's more powerful when you start like but actually building her. the deck towards yeah. her. Ooh, that's going to be ugly to see in the wild. <laughs> what do you mean? It would be a beautiful sight to the whole <laughs> um, The I thought the Populate deck was also really, really solid out of the box. I think it's more the same thing. You are making resources out of out of thin air. You play your commander and you make that rhino, and then you swing and populate and make a rhino. And there's so many things in that deck that give you resources beyond what is on the physical card. And that is a real huge advantage playing in that kind of limited environment. And I the card advantage beyond just that too, the artifact it's it was an idol of oblivion, the one that you that makes the Eldrazi token. Yeah, it can draw you a card if you've made a token that turn, and then you can like pay 8 or yeah. 10 or something, and it makes a big 10-10. So basically, you tap it to draw a card every turn, right. is what I was doing with it. I mean, really consistently, it was just a free card for me. And then late in the game, when I really didn't need cards in hand because I was getting them from... There was the there's the enchantment that whenever... At your upkeep, if you control a creature with power 4 or greater, you draw a card. Yep. Um, you know, I had that out something else. I was getting enough extra cards that I could crack it to make the big Eldrazi. Yeah. That you could then populate off Jared's ability or populate off any of the other populate effects in that deck. It just got out of control. And even without any way to grant them trample, you're, I was just throwing so many bodies at people every single turn that even if I couldn't poke through, they couldn't the next turn make that many blockers again. 
Right, that felt like the deck that definitely didn't have a difficulty yeah. of closing things out. And even if, like, so you go home then and take it and throw in an overrun and an overwhelming stampede and a primal rage to give your guys trample. And, and like, for three or four dollars, you can very easily add a bunch of win conditions in that deck and make it that much better, let alone when you add your doubling season or parallel lives <laughs> right. or running or procession, those kind of cards. So like that one, I think is going to be really, really solid, and it's also I think I, I called it a meat and potatoes commander on our review show. It absolutely felt like Grandma's cooking when I was playing. <laughs> it was like it was real stable and heavy and satisfying to to play. So I really did enjoy that deck on like a just simple gutting it out old school magic style. None of us played Madness. Did you guys encounter Madness? What were your thoughts on that deck when you were uh, playing we against it? We encountered it. Uh, Henry Stukenberg, I believe, got that for his yeah. deck. He played it. It seemed to do what it wanted to do with Anji, but... It, it, it did a lot of things, but I don't think there's cards in the deck to make those things useful. Right. What are you talking about? There are two in Garrick's Wake in that deck. <laughs> yeah, that's right. No, that's what it is. That's the key. If you play like that, maybe it's way better. No, like, he was busy... He yeah. was constantly pitching cards and doing things, but I think the power level of the madness stuff isn't enough to to catch up everything else. Um, and I don't know if there's enough madness stuff out there beyond just the precon, even because it's not a mechanic that's been it's been printed I think twice. Mm. And they're real cautious with it too. I think so. I just don't know if there's enough stuff to make it strong, but maybe there is. At the very least, it's an interesting interactive deck. I was really intrigued every time that I saw the Black Red Chainer come. Yeah. Play. I like Chainer a lot, and I still like Grieven a lot. Yeah, I mean, he's just cool. I, I, like, I think I like those commanders the most, especially because that's the deck that has Kyrick in it, so maybe I'm yeah, biased. Yeah, yeah. Well, Kyrick's really good. I mean, that, that, that deck, I think, has the most interesting commanders in it. Yeah, I, I think that that's where I'm at with it as well. So, okay, I, I think we'll briefly... Uh, talk about any maybe fun games we played before we wrap it up here. Is there anything notable anyone wants to mention? I've played so many games, it's hard to remember, to be honest. That was kind of my thought here a little bit, too. <laughs> i played so many games and met so many people. Right, um, and thanks to yeah. every listener that came up and played with us or just said hi. I signed multiple Rocky History Kamigawa commanders for people. That was super crazy. Yeah, I was actually asked to sign a Marin and a very, very pretty Mimeoplasm. Um, I, f- I felt like I was defacing it. I felt bad. But it was it was really honoring. There was two different times someone asked me to sign a play mat, and like there was a big open spot next to LSV signature, and I'm like, I'm not gonna <laughs> sign anywhere near. I'm like, I can't. I think you should. I'm gonna find a corner over there and put my name on it because I just feel like a jerk putting my name remotely close to his in a play mat. So this is a question that's just popping in my head. Did you guys play against any of the precon commanders that someone had like built a 99 at home, and then as soon as they got the deck when they arrived at the GP? Then they had the commander ready for it. Did you play against any of those? I played against a, uh, a Yura deck. Um, the guy was sleeving it up when I sat down, and he actually said he got caught a little bit off guard because it was a friend of Don Miner's who was going to build the deck to play it on like Friday, but Don had went to Walmart on Thursday to get some air mattresses for where we were all staying, and they had accidentally released the put the decks out a day early. Oh, that's right. I heard yeah. about that. Yeah. They broke street day. So Don bought them several of the decks <laughs> yeah. and g- gave one to his friend who was going to build the Jira deck anyway. So the guy was quick sleeving it up as we sat out to play and he had mostly tweaked it. It wasn't like, I think the land base was untouched, sure. but he had a doubling season. He had a parallel lives in it. Um, and it blew up like with, with just those, even with a, with a basic mana base, the parallel lives hit and he's making, you know, four, Rhino tokens a turn, and he had actual win conditions. Yeah. Um, he had put in like a god sire, so like he had a god sire. He was making tokens of the god sire because he was copying it. Or a helm of the host. Yeah, I, I didn't see it, but I think Gered. he had one. Oh no! Helm of the host on Gered sounds absolutely nasty. Yeah, yeah. I so, want to do it now. <laughs> <laughs> so I, it, it was really cool. Yeah, I played against um, also just one person who had uh, a deck built for that, and that was against Kirik. The guy had built a mono black infect deck with Kirik at the helm. Okay. Um, and we could not let him do things. I'll put it <laughs> that sure. way. Sure. Yeah, absolutely. We, we, we were very much afraid. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's one of those commanders, like, with someone casts it, you're like, oh, I'm probably just going to lose now if that happens. Yeah. So. Um, all in all, it was just a crazy weekend, and I haven't even entirely processed it yet, and I'm sure we'll have more to say on the part two of this podcast. Yeah, so since this is a crossover show, and I'm here on Dana's 
other podcast. His <laughs> first podcast. His other podcast. His normal podcast. Mom and dad, stop it. <laughs> uh, we're going to be doing part two of this conversation on the EDH Recast, um, which is going to be coming out Friday, by the way. I know that this one comes out a lot earlier. In the yeah, week. so it's going to be on Monday, so that'll come out on Friday. Um, so tune in there. Come listen to Dana's real podcast for the rest of our thoughts about GP Vegas. All right. That's going to wrap up this show. You can find me on Twitter at Dana Roach. You can find me at CMDR Central underscore Max. And you can find me at Joseph M. Schultz on Twitter. Uh, we'll be back next week with another show. Until then, thank you very much for listening. Thank you.